When did it become okay for me to neglect me? And even worse, when did it become okay for me to joke about, you know, my own neglect? And I mean, it, it, it shook me all the way down. That was Kelly Wilson, and you are listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. Curious what psychologists chat about over coffee? We are three clinical psychologists who love to discuss the best ideas from psychology. I'm Dr. Diana Hill, practicing in Seaside, Santa Barbara, California. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado. And from coast to coast, I'm Dr. Yael Schoengren, a Boston-based clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Brown University. In this podcast, we explore the psychological principles that we use in our clinical work. And we bring you ideas from psychology that can help you flourish in your work, parenting, relationships, and health. Thank you for listening to Psychologist Off the Clock. Hi, everyone. Before we get started today, we wanted to just make a quick plug. We have a new feature, which is that we are set up as Amazon affiliates. And so a great way to support our podcast would be to click on our website to make any purchases you're planning to make on Amazon. We have a little icon. You can just start there. You can also link to different books that we mentioned through Amazon, and it will help support the finances of our podcast. It's been a bit of a labor of love, and this will help us cover some of our expenses and that kind of thing. Thank you. So today's episode is a really important one for me, and I think I've referenced Kelly Wilson on a lot of our episodes that we've done, ladies, but that's because Kelly Wilson's work has really been integral in my professional and personal life for about the past 12 years. And he is one of the co-founders of ACT. And in this episode, we get a chance to listen to Dr. Wilson talk about everything from evolution science to how in his 50s, he started taking better care of his body. Uh, And the episode is a lot like how some of Kelly Wilson's workshops are, where he walks you through sort of through story, uh, some of the what he calls the particulars. Uh, so how did the episode ep- influence the two of you? I'm curious. What were your thoughts about it? For me, there was a part um, toward the end where he talks a bit about parenting and how as parents, I, I won't give too much of a spoiler, but I'll just say something about how as parents connecting with our own suffering can connect us to our kids in a deeper way. And it was so powerful. I have thought about that probably a hundred times since I listened to it. I, I just found it really deeply impactful. Yeah. And I, I thought he covered so much ground and, and made so many important points, but I will say that, um, you know, he's a bit more on the, uh, extreme side of healthy practices than I am. And so with these kind of interviews, I sometimes wonder how much I'll relate to, to how much to, to some of the practices that are suggested. And for those of you who like me are, uh, let's call it more moderate. I just want to say that there's a lot of wisdom in here. And what I love that Kelly Wilson suggests is that you don't have to do all of the healthy practices. You can pick really small things and just build small habits for yourself that work. Um, but I did love a couple of things that he said. So one of the things that I especially appreciated was his comment that we have a pretty casual relationship with things like medicine and other approaches that we have to just helping ourselves feel better. And sometimes that it's useful to kind of pause and wonder if some of the practices that we use to help ourselves feel better with, whether it's a headache or, or, uh, some other physical ailment or an emotional problem, um, whether some of the strategies that we're using are actually causing new problems. And so I think that that's a really important thing to be wondering about for our everyday practices, um, in general. I think that what this episode also brought me back to was, the memory of a workshop that I did with him a few years back at ACBS. And it was with our good friend, Ray and uh, Meg McKelvey. And we were uh, learning the whole workshop was around kindness and how to be kinder to ourselves. And he walked us through some of the eight, eight practices for wellness that he talks about in this episode. And in that workshop, I think that I got a better understanding of actually how I could care for myself and care for myself in a way that 
I actually would like care for my kids. And from that point, I remember we did this thing called the matrix that maybe someday we'll do an episode about, but we did a matrix on self-care and some specific practices that we wanted to build into our lives. And I, and Ray wrote it all down for me and I folded it up and put it in my makeup case. And I've carried it around with me for the past two years. And whenever I travel, it's like all has like makeup all over it and it's all rubbed out. And I open up that little folded piece of paper and I check in on myself of like, how am I doing in this area of self-care? Because I think it's one that I have struggled with a lot. And he talks about giving us a permission slip. And I think he really gave me a permission slip at that workshop that day to, to really take better care of me. So I hope that you find this episode, um, helpful to all of you. And, um, it's just really a great honor to have him on psychologist off the clock. Kelly G. Wilson is a professor of psychology at the University of Mississippi. He is past and founding president of the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science. Dr. Wilson is one of the founders of Acceptance and Commitment Therapy and has devoted himself to the development and dissemination of ACT and its underlying theory and philosophy for nearly 30 years. Dr. Wilson has published more than 90 articles and chapters as well as 11 books, including Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, The Process and Practice of Mindful Change, Mindfulness for Two, which is my favorite, and Things Might Go Terribly Horribly Wrong. He has central interest in the application of behavioral principles to understanding topics such as health and well-being, purpose, meaning and values, therapeutic relationship, and mindfulness. Dr. Wilson is the founder of One Life Education and Training and has presented workshops and provided consultancy in 32 countries. Welcome, Dr. Wilson. Well, thank you. It's, uh, I'm so glad to be with you. As you know, I am a bit of a groupie. I've been following you around, attending to every training that I possibly can, like a little duckling with you. And my history with you goes back to about 2006 when I was in graduate school. And you came to Denver to a small group of graduate students to present on ACT and the Hexaflex model. It's so sort of early in that time where you just had a flip pad of paper that you kind of scribbled on and you showed up in your classic black t-shirt and blue jeans. And what really struck me that day and led me to want to uh, keep following you and learning from you as much as possible was how you were willing to show up fully as a human. You weren't just an academic studying suffering, but you were one that really new suffering, and you brought so much of your heart to the work. Can you speak a little bit about how what you study is really rooted in in suffering and even your own personal experience? Um, you know, there's a funny thing, and it's kind of like this kind of a joke that runs around clinical psychology. Um, and uh, I don't know how many times I've been asked, not the question you're asking, Um, But the kind of question like, did you get interested in psychology so you could figure out what's wrong with you or something like that? Um, And I I don't personally find that question particularly um, uh, interesting myself. Um, But this other one about um, a a person's own suffering and being uh, in contact with it, it's it's been uh, deeply uh, informative uh, uh, for me. I mean, from an evolutionary perspective, um, you know, to look into um, the things that um, frighten us and the things that we long for, um, you know, really cuts across people. And so our willingness to sort of look within and to be present for that which uh, rises up in us uh, can give us... um, a clues about what might be going on, you know, with uh, the people in front of us um, and sometimes makes a clear behavior that looks very perplexing from the outside. Um, and it, it, now this is, I'm not everybody's cup of tea. So, I mean, there are plenty of people who have got up in the first five minutes and, you know, gone running out of the room and certainly plenty of students at the University of Mississippi who, you know, uh, I mean, they all have to take graduate learning from me. But boy, there's some of them who never spent another minute with me the whole time they were here. But there have been enough people who um, it, 
it it's sort of um, I'm sort of a permission slip for them to bring their whole self uh, to their work. Uh, and, and I'm glad for that. And that's, I think, how your work has really influenced me over the years in that I feel like I more and more are able to show up as my full authentic self as a therapist and just show up as a human in the therapy room. And even as a human that has my own feelings of inadequacy and my own struggles. And one of the things that you talk about a lot is responding to those feelings of inadequacy and struggle with more kindness. Can you speak to that? Uh, Naomi Shahib Nye in her poem, Kindness, which is magnificent. Um, uh, she says, if you want to know kindness as the deepest thing, uh, you need to know sadness uh, as the other deepest thing. Um, and she talks about you know, that it's then that you get a sense of the size of the cloth. And I think when people get a sense of the size of the cloth, it is, as she says, only uh, kindness makes sense. Sometimes it's much easier for people to get that, you know, when they get that their children will meet this sense of inadequacy, that their friends meet this sense of inadequacy. It's often easier for us to be kind to others than it is to ourselves. Um, so I'll orient people towards places where it's easier for them to be kind. And then I'll uh, ask them to imagine, you know, that, that they could offer themselves that same sort of kindness. Um, it's in the particulars, you know, like if I, like a, a favorite question of mine, um, is, uh, can you think of somebody who you love like crazy, you know, just in the most complete and unreasonable way. And I, I, I like to ask people to like, think about the face of someone who they love like crazy, maybe someone small. And it, if that is maybe someone who's ever caught them looking at them, you know, where they could see like how much you love them. And then I like to ask people a harder thing. Imagine that you were someone who you love like that, you know, with that open heart. It just seems to me that that kind of conversation with that sort of perspective taking and openness to experience um, uh, creates a kind of conversational space, a social space that um, leaves people permission, you know, to have their full humanness with them. Recently, a lot of your work has been focused not only on psychological health, but also on physical health and well-being. And you draw a lot from evolutionary science and this sort of concept of evolutionary mismatch, which is the idea that our modern environment does not match our genes. So humans aren't designed to be sitting all day, nor are we designed to be in the social isolation. Can you talk about evolutionary science and how it's influencing your understanding of what it means to be psychologically and physically healthy? I, I mean, I, I know that there are a few people out there who just think that I'm like, just impossibly self-involved. Um, but you know, again, I, I just don't seem to be able to learn anything and unless I can sort of connect with it. And this really started this interest in kind of globally in health and well-being and evolutionary mismatch um, really began um, about uh, a little over nine years ago when I had the very good fortune of having David Sloan Wilson, who is a wonderful leading edge evolutionary uh, biologist who's interested in what is called multi-level selection. So not the sort of genocentric genes as destiny uh, story, which is um, a false, um, uh, uh, is just wrong. Um, you know, genes are genes in context and evolutionary histories are evolutionary histories in context. So Anyway, I, I was doing a workshop up in Eugene, Oregon. I was uh, talking to people about doing values, work, and act. And I said, well, you know, you can work on any value you want. Um, I said, uh, or, 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 or not. 
you know, and, uh, you know, uh, so for example, self-care, uh, you know, I'm in the H.L. Mencken school of self-care. Whenever I get the urge to strong physical exercise, I lie down until it passes. And the people in the room laugh and I laugh. And, you know, then later I'm doing this values exercise with them. And in this values exercise, I ask people that question, you know, like about imagine the face of someone who you love with all your heart, you know, wildly and help to get them in touch with that. And of course, when I lead exercises, I do the exercise myself at the same time. And so I'm seeing the face of one of my children. And then I ask them, you know, if, you know, what if you were somebody who you loved like that? And if you were, what would you offer them in this universe of values? And my joke that I'd told a thousand times came rolling back up. And, you know, when I thought about that joke applied to you know, a child that I loved, you know, whenever, you know, uh, my daughter Emma gets the, you know, urge to strong physical exercise, I have her lie down till it passes. It just wasn't funny. It wasn't funny at all, you know. And I started on the side of that lake in this forest in Sweden to think about when did it become okay for me to neglect me? And even worse, when did it become okay for me to joke about, you know, my own neglect? And I mean, it, it, it shook me all the way down. Um, and so what I determined on the edge of that lake in the Swedish forest was that um, I was going to start taking care of Kelly, you know, just like someone I loved. And um, I came home from that uh, trip to Europe with my family. And uh, I went down to my, local uh, yoga studio, Southern Star Yoga Studio, same studio I was at this morning, nine years later. And, uh, and uh, I um, signed up for a yoga class. And how did you get from that first yoga class to now having all these practices that you're promoting for living well? You know, I immediately started thinking, well, if I'm going to take care of this human being, Ken Wilson, then I better find out what kind of critter he is. And, you know, the next thing I know, I am reading, you know, the sort of evolved, you know, what kind of, what are we, what kind of, you know, what's good for human beings? You know, what kind of niche are we evolved to inhabit? Um, And this just launched me, you know, like into um, that, you know, what I, you know, I read, I I mean, I I was reading so much science about um, kind of how human beings are mismatched to the modern world that I had to take like a year off to read. And I mean, I was reading, uh, you know, biomechanics and, uh, you know, cardiac science and, uh, you know, uh, looking at what illnesses are like really rising up right now um, um, and which ones are falling away. Like, what are we dying of in the modern world? And then trying to understand uh, from an evolutionary perspective why that might uh, be. Um, a guy in, bi- in biology named uh, evolutionary biology named Dobzhansky. And Dobzhansky says, Uh, that nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution science. And I got what David Sloan Wilson was asking me, which was, you know, this question and my conclusion, which is nothing makes sense in psychology except in light of evolutionary biology. Like to understand ourselves as evolved beings is to understand um, in many, many regards the nature of modern illness. What I found in that year of just, you know, reading epidemiology and global burden of disease, and I mean, just a wild amount of stuff is that there are these, there's this set of risk factors and the risk factors for Um, the physical illnesses that are 
rising up and raging in the world. You know, like we've had a tripling of the level of uh, type two diabetes in the last 30 years. Um, we've, uh, uh, you know, we have gone from, uh, 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 to a place where you have, you know, something like 35% obesity rates in a huge swath um, of the United States. I've got some data by a company, um, used to be called Medco. They've been swallowed, um, but they're a prescription provider. That same swath of states also has the highest rates of psychiatric medications in the country. Um, one in four um, uh, in this data set covering tens of millions of lives, one in four individuals is on psychiatric meds. Um, um, and if you look at, like, for example, the interrelatedness of these things, it's stunning. So um, in a National Health Service data set out of the United Kingdom, people uh, who are obese have about a 55% uh, higher likeliness of developing depression. People who are depressed have about the same increase in likeliness of becoming obese. These are not separate illnesses. They're just not separate. Now, the good news is that globally, um, uh, health has never been better. There's never been a time in human history when you know, people um, are more likely uh, to be born and uh, to live uh, a long uh, and full life. Uh, so the burden of disease has shifted from many diseases that uh, killed us uh, to many illnesses that um, disable us. So what you're pointing to is that we're living longer, but even though we're living longer, we have more disability diseases such as obesity, depression that are impacting the vitality of our lives. Well, let's just say, you know, and I, and I don't want to be one of these people who are, are sort of like, you know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling because the sky is not, it, it, it's just not falling. I mean, if you look at, take something like, um, like I, I have children and I have buried, um, three of my brothers, um, one at 36, my brother, Randy from suicide, um, uh, one at 47, um, my brother, uh, Michael, uh, who had a cardiac arrest on the heels of heaven knows what. And my brother, David, who died of a massive cerebral hemorrhage at the age of 53. Now, these are all deaths that are like way too young. Um, and I used to talk to people about like, imagine my mother, you know, imagine burying half of your own children. And then I started looking at the history of child mortality. 200 years ago, global infant mortality was 43%. Global infant mortality is now 4.3%. That's, a, you know, an order of magnitude. The risks from those things have plummeted unbelievably. And it's a, a huge human success story. But are these extraordinary mismatches. Like if you look at the top uh, 10 causes of years lost to disability uh, at the very top. Um, I, there's some new um, reports out and these might have shifted a little bit, but, you know, by one place, maybe. Um, but my current slide deck, the number one cause of years lost to disability globally is back and neck pain. Now, why might that be? <laughs> you know, uh, you know, how could that be like the number one? Well, I would say that um, never in human history, and this is really, really recent, um, have as many people in the world made a living sitting. You know, we sit for incredible, incredible amounts of time uh, every day. Um, 200 years ago, 75% of the U.S. labor force worked in agriculture. No tractors or combines or anything. We're talking about, you know, pulling and lifting and carrying and digging and 75% of the labor force. 
now 1.5% of the labor force, right? A lot of those guys went into factories, but now they're coming out of factories. Um, and, you know, the, the desk chair, you know, is, you know, kind of modern foot binding. I mean, it's a risk factor uh, for the number one cause of uh, disability. Number two, depression. Um, uh, you know, one of the literatures I read when I was reading all this crazy stuff was animal models of illness. And I know this will be disturbing to you and probably disturbing to lots of people listening, but the people who explore how to treat illnesses will very often begin with animal models of illness. Now, when a, a, a researcher wants to study depression in rats, for example, they don't go out and find the depressed rats you know, they don't like give them depression surveys to, you know, see who's depressed. If they want to study depressed rats, they make them depressed. Right. So they create depression. There are a couple of ways you can do that. Um, here's a way you can do it. Isolate them. If you take a very, very social animal like a rat and like us, by the way, and you put them in isolation, you can produce um, um, all of the sort of symptoms uh, of depression uh, that you might want to see, uh, including disrupted social function, it, it just by is that single factor. Um, now, if you give them a little bit of an antidepressant, you can get a little lifting of that. But there's this other thing you can do. Stop isolating them. <laughs> you know, and it reverses. Uh, another way you can do that is to uh, immobilize them. So you sort of hold their little rat arms and legs immobile a couple hours a day and, and you can produce depression, anxiety. Well, think about, you know, when I started reading about these animal models of illness and then I thought and then I started looking at my own life, it was like, oh, my God, I'm like living inside of, you know, animal models of illness. Never in human history have as many people lived alone as live alone right now. Um, you couldn't live alone. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, even just, you know, I'm 64 years old up until I was 12 years old. So 52 years ago, my little brother, David, and I slept in a little narrow bed, probably, you know, not four feet across. Um, it, that is what human, how human beings lived for millions of years. And now, you know, we're, you could literally spend, live the rest of your life um, without seeing another human being. But just because you could do it doesn't make it healthy. It really seems that when you're looking at animal models and evolutionary science to understand mental health, that the conclusions that we can make around what would be a way healthier ways of living are really kind of simple ones. And I know that you've written quite about a bit about this, but you know, for our in-house, it's things like go to bed when the sun goes to bed, because that's when humans probably are meant to go to bed or, um, you know, growing food that in my garden that my grandma probably grew in her garden. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the things that you've been promoting and even practicing for yourself based on your conclusions of, from evolution science and animal models? Um, I've got a set of uh, practices. And um, when I originally did the talk, it was seven practices. So um, I make sure, you know, um, I was one of those people who could get by on four or five hours of sleep a night. And I did for decades um, until I found out that everything that you study in an abnormal psychology class in terms of mood regulation, uh, uh, impulse control, uh, attention, uh, uh, appetite, you know, all of these things are interrelated. So, you know, I started Kelly to bed you know, uh, and, uh, taking very good care of that. Um, uh, that, that is not a problem until, you know, very, very recently because, you know, 
it got dark. And when it got dark and it was dangerous to go outside, you know, you're inside and it's dark, you know, you sleep. Um, you know, we've got now you can live in an environment that is lit up 24 hours a day. You can live in an environment that doesn't cool off at night like the environment that we lived in for millions of years. So we've engineered these problems. So I'm just reverse engineering the environment. In uh, evolution, our evolutionary history, you had to move um, uh, for probably hundreds of minutes a day uh, to get enough calories, you know, to live and eat. Now, I don't move for hundreds of minutes a day, but I certainly have read the science and uh, move my body, not just in some vigorous activity um, uh, each day, but uh, small amounts of movement throughout the day. Um, and a lot of these kind of hacks are really simple. You know, like if a person sees clients and they just go, up and down a flight of stairs between each client. You know, it's not much more than that. Um, I changed um, what I ate, beginning very, you know, small. Um, and, you know, at this point of time in time, um, I eat um, very, very little in the way of processed foods. Um, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, eat real food, um, not too much, mostly fruits and vegetables is probably not a bad idea. Um, diet science is a crazy mess. Um, my guess is that there are lots of ways to eat healthy. None of them involve large amounts of, um, food that comes from a box or a bag. Um, no one, no one is advocating uh, except for the people who make them advocating diets that are high in processed foods. Um, and there are all kinds of reasons why those things um, produce illness, um, uh, including gargantuan quantities of sugar and uh, seed oils that are, you know, literally toxic at the levels that we consume them. Um, I, I, try to, um, uh, and by the way, I'm not like a saint or anything, you know, I mean, you know, uh, my wife took me out to dinner this weekend cause it was my birthday. And, uh, you know, after dinner, we had a big old piece of, uh, blueberry, um, uh, uh bread pudding. And it was, you know, delightful and, you know, uh, so what? It really is the pattern that matters, not, you know, the kind of acute, you know, uh, a particular, any particular meal. Um, I pay attention to the kind of toxic exposures I get. Um, uh, and we're exposed to lots and lots of toxins in this world that didn't even exist um, in the not too distant past. Um, some of them are obvious, like, you know, uh, tobacco and uh, excessive amounts of alcohol. Some of them are more insidious. We live in a medication happy culture and we are advised, you know, every minute of every day, you know, through the media that if we have a headache, we should take a, you know, something for that. And if our stomach doesn't feel good, we should take something for that. And, you know, most people um, are taking, uh, you know, often people are taking multiple kinds of medications every day. I'm not anti-medication, but we have been sold an altogether too casual um, acquaintance with medication. You know, our our day-to-day uh, -day exchange with them um, is not promoting health. Um, as a matter of fact, there are lots of them um, where the persistent taking of the medication produces the very problem that the medication uh, was taken to uh, fix. So, for example, pain medications are like that. Um, one of the 
most rapidly rising um, illnesses is uh, medication-induced headaches, um, uh, proton pump inhibitors to reduce stomach acid taken over the course of even just a couple of weeks will produce gastric problems in uh, uh, healthy people with no gastric problems. So, you know, to, you know, begin to make small changes in these things. And I, I recognize as I start to talk about these things that, you know, people probably hear it and they're like, oh, my God, you know, this guy's like living like a monk or something like that. Um, this is a set of practices that began really, really, really small. Like I started off when I came back from that trip to Sweden, going to gentle yoga for special needs. Um, because at the age of 55, that's all I could do, you know, gentle yoga for special needs. Um, and each of the practices that I've picked up since then has been, um, gently and making really, really small changes really, really slowly over time. Um, and I'm not done. You know, I'm, I'm, I continue to explore ways that I can treat myself with care and kindness. So for listeners that are interested in learning more about those practices for living well, we'll put a link to the blog that you've written about the eight practices. And then I also really highly recommend the book chapter that you have in Steve Hayes and David Sloan Wilson's new book that's out on evolution science. And the eight practices are minimizing toxins, eating real food, moving your body, allowing yourself more to have more sleep opportunities for sleep, engaging in regular and meaningful activities, practicing mindfulness, and cultivating your social network, and then finally cultivating acts of self-compassion. And I love how you've written that small things matter and patterns matter. I really have taken these um, practices to heart over the past few years and really trying to look at my environment and see ways in which I can make changes in my environment to support me in doing some of these things. And, you know, some of the changes I've made were like, a couple years back, I took all my shoes out of my closet and laid them out on the floor and got rid of any shoe that had a heel. It was a really sad day, but I really wanted to get my foot in better alignment and have it be a more natural alignment and kind of move towards more barefoot living, which is something I know you do, uh, Dr. Wilson. Another way that I've used some of the environment to support, you know, moving more are things like having a standing desk so that you know, when I am working on a podcast or recording, I'm standing up instead of sitting down. But then when I am sitting, doing more floor sitting. And so we've been sitting, I've been sitting on the floor more with clients. And when I sit on the floor, it means I have to get down into like a low quat, squat position, or I'm just moving and shifting my body slightly and doing subtle adjustments. So it's almost like being doing some of the things that you would do in a yoga class, but I'm doing them throughout my day. And over time, hopefully that'll help my body just feel better from all the, as a therapist, I obviously sit quite a bit. It's really not that hard to make some of these small changes, but I think it's also really important that we do so because everything in our environment right now is working against us in terms of it's really designed, our modern environment is, is designed for us to move less and eat foods that are less healthy. So I think it's helpful to use some of these behavioral principles to make some small changes. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. You know, I mean, we have food manufacturers out there that are unembarrassedly engineering foods for overconsumption. Uh, you know, I mean, they are designing them so that we will eat too many. And as a matter of fact, everybody listening to this has heard, you know, Lay's potato chips, I'll bet you can't eat just one. You know, I mean, they're, they're saying this food has been designed so that you will eat more than you meant to eat. I mean, so, and, and I think you're right. You really, the, the best hacks um, are, are ones that um, you bake into your environment, you know. And so like that kind of thing, like you're talking about, 
Um, I, you know, I, it doesn't have to take extra time. Uh, you know, when I'm at the airport, uh, I spend a lot of time at airports, I fly a lot every year. Um, you know that, that from one end of the Atlanta airport to the other end of the Atlanta airport is over a mile. Um, everybody's jamming onto these trains. But if you walk the tunnels, it's over a mile from one end of that airport to the other. Um, very often when I'm at the gate, my standard waiting at the gate is I'll be in a full squat, um, you know, butt to the ground, you know, and I've got my iPad there and I'm like reading the newspaper and like that. But, it, you know, it's no more trouble to um, squat, you know, while I wait at the gate than it would be to um, uh, stand or sit in a chair. I mean, when I first started doing it, I couldn't get down at all. And then when I could get down at all, I could get down there for about five seconds and my feet hurt, my hips hurt, my back you know, and everything. Now, I mean, it's a restful place for me to drop all the way into a squat. And like a lot of people in the modern world, and especially with a certain number of birthdays, 64, um, it feels great on my lower back. Like it. It is just sumptuous. I mean, really, really lovely. There's a kind of stretch across my lumbar spine there that is, you know, um, wonderful. Um, and it started in gentle yoga for special needs. That makes me want to get into a squat position. I imagine all our listeners want to try that as well. What other things are you doing that are out of the box that sort of align with your philosophies around living well? I'm a creature of extremes. And so uh, one of the places I've gone is I, I, uh, I do, uh, I run barefoot on trails. After some time, slow, and I'm slow out in the woods. Um, and I thought for so many years that I was somebody who hated exercise. But one of the things I learned out in the woods, you know, squatting down in the, you know, dirt and, you know, moving with my feet on the ground like that is I remembered that I didn't always hate exercise, that when I was little, um, when my brothers and when my brothers were alive and when we used to run, you know, we would run through the woods like, you know, like wild <laughs> creatures, you know, and uh, and we loved it. We loved the speed and the feel of the wind moving across our bodies. Um, I run for my brothers these days, you know, I care for myself. Um, you know, as they might have, you know, had they lived long enough, had I had a chance to be a good influence on them, heaven knows I was a terrible influence on them uh, so many times. As a parent, I'm often looking back at my interactions with my children and worrying that I've damaged them in some way for life. And one of the things that you said at a workshop once that really impacted me and that I repeat back to myself when I'm in that position of being hard on myself is I pity the kid with the perfect parent. And I think your approach to imperfection is a really empowering one in parenthood because you point to how our imperfection really offers us greater ability to build empathy and connection and understanding of, of our children. Can you talk about why you pity the kid with a perfect parent? Well, you know, I asked that, that, you know, and you mentioned that question that I very often ask at workshops, you know, that question about what is the thing about you? that you least like about you. And so if people want to like understand, you know, why I would say that if people just pause for a minute, if, if you just pause for a minute and think about the thing about you that you least like about you, the one that has caused you the most trouble over time. And you kind of look around in your own life at what that has cost, you know, things that are maybe broken um, and you know something about how they got broken or maybe things that are not there 
um, and you know why they're not there anymore. Um, maybe things you longed for, but because of that thing about you, you did not reach out for it. And I ask people to like settle into that and then to follow it back in time, you know, to think back, when did you first have a sense, you know, that there was that thing about you, you know, and maybe if people think back in time, they can remember when they got a fancy name for it. But if they follow the line back, sometimes they can remember earlier times when they didn't have a name for it, but they had a sense of it. You know, that there was something about them that was not like the other kids. Now, when people discover, you know, and I've asked about this in rooms with, you know, I mean, over the years, thousands, thousands of people I've asked about this all over the world. And if you settle people in and they really think back in time to, you know, you know, for most people. And I've done show of hands kinds of things, you know, for most people, if they settle in, they can follow that back to like, you know, maybe uh, teen adolescence, but much more commonly school age. Um, and very, very commonly they can follow it back in time. If they're like me where they can't remember, a, you know, where I can't really remember a me where I didn't remember having a kind of a sense that there was something about me that wasn't like the other kids. So if people can get that, then I'll very often like, um, and you've probably seen me do it. I'll ask somebody in the room, you know, anybody in here got a little one in their life who um, they love, you know, um, like crazy, you know, child, uh, niece, nephew, child of a friend. Um, and I ask them uh, to imagine um, two worlds. So one world, we can go back to that day when they felt out of place, not enough. Dumber than the other kids. More fearful than the other kids. Whatever it was. That we could go back to that time I, I asked him to imagine a world where I could go back to that time and erase that day and erase every cost since that day and every cost going forward. And that that is stricken from their universe. So it is a world without all the pains that have been caused by that all the way back into childhood. And then I'll ask him to imagine another world where they continue to carry that weight you know, the knowing of that thing about, you know, themselves. And maybe even more intensely where sometimes it just rises up, you know, like water over their heads. So there are two worlds. One where it's completely gone and one where you know it deeply and sometimes quite painfully. And I ask and they notice that this little one is you know, sad, like there's something not quite right. And they go ask this little one, what's the matter? And this little one says, I'm not like the other kids at school. And you ask them, what do you mean? And they start to tell you this story. And it's your story, your story of feeling out of place to much or too little, whatever it was. And if you choose that world where that pain is stricken from your history, you have no idea what they're talking about. It is incomprehensible to you. And what you have to offer them is, oh, oh, you're perfect, honey. You know, you're all right. Um, but if you choose that other world where you continue to carry it, 
you know, they look up into the eyes of mom or auntie or whoever it is they're looking into their eyes and they can see in those eyes somebody who knows them. Um, and then I ask people, to, you know, to choose which world would you choose? And um, for me and for, you know, so far, everybody I've ever asked that question, you know, they choose the one where they carry the pain if that pain allows them to hear the heart of someone who they love. And, you know, I think that it's true that we don't get to choose whether our children um, meet that day or not, only whether they meet it alone or not. And that part we have some choice about. That part, we can be there for that conversation, um, not necessarily by disclosure, but just by the availability, you know, to keep our vulnerabilities uh, near. Um, I think, you know, that um, values and vulnerabilities are really poured from the same vessel in equal measure. And I don't know any way to turn away from vulnerabilities that does not involve also turning away from values. Sebastian Moore, who's a Catholic theologian who I love dearly, he says, the rejection of our common fate makes us strangers to each other. The rejection of our common fate makes us strangers to each other. The election of that fate in love reveals us as one body. Right? It doesn't make us one. It shows us that we were already one. Uh, you know, that first part, the rejection of our common fate, we can look into our own history, you know, at the day when we sorted out that we were not like the other kids and then watch what did we do, you know, to conceal that or to compensate for it. You know, did we spell big words? You know, did we, you know, um, puff ourselves up and look mean and scary? Did we get really, really quiet and small? Did we become really, really nice or helpful? Or, you know, on and on and on the ways that we reject our common fate. The visiting of it, I don't think that we have a choice in. The context, when it visits, that we have some choices that we can make, that we can do ourselves and that we can teach our children. You know, to not make suffering a disease. It's not a disease. And, and being different is not a disease. It's not a disease. It seems it really boils down to acceptance. I, sometimes I like to ask people in a workshop, look around at the people in this room. You know, look at the color and texture of their hair, the shapes of their noses and eyes and mouths. And, you know, you just see this incredible variability. Why would we expect the insides would be any different than that? Just this extraordinary palette of differences. Half of the work I do as a clinical psychologist is to try to teach people not to make an enemy of their own complexity, you know, of their own differences. You know, I had uh, one of my grad students the other day in my supervisees, clinical supervisees, she says to me something like, uh, she's like, I, I actually barred two of my supervisees from bringing a clipboard into sessions uh, for 30 days. I said, I want 30 days of abstinence. You might be a candidate for, you know, moderated clipboard usage, but, you know, all the moderation programs recommend 30 days of abstinence to begin moderation. So, you know, 30 days, no clipboard. And, and they're all like, you know, like, oh, no, I'll forget. And, you know, I won't be able to read. I'm like, come on, you know. I mean, all of our sessions are recorded. It's a training clinic, you know. And, and, uh, one of them says to me when we were walking up uh, to the parking lot, she says, well, you know, I'm really ADHD and everything. And I'm like, I'm like, you know, don't make an enemy of that. 
don't make an enemy of it because that person who has that sort of brand of ADHD, you know, what it means is, you know, that they're sort of not looking where they're supposed to be looking all the time. You know, they're looking over here and then they're looking over there and was that a bunny and, you know, and like that. But, you know, those people who are like that and, you know, by the way, I'm like that. I mean, if you read my first grade report card, that's what it, you know, the teacher's notes sound like, you know, Kelly won't sit down. Kelly won't quit talking. Kelly talks without raising his hand. Kelly doesn't follow instructions. You know, I'm all over the place bouncing off the walls. Fortunately, it's 1959. So, you know, there's no diagnoses. You know, they just thought I was bad, you know. <laughs> but, you know, that that kid that is looking nine different places might put two things together that no one else would have ever thought to put together. They're that kid, too. So is it a disability? Well, it puts you at risk for some things. But, you know, it's also your superpower, you know. You know, like if you're really, really tall, you're at risk for bumping your head. You know, but that's not a disability. You're also at risk for, you know, making the slam dunk. You know, you're also at risk for being class president, you know. So, you know, inside too, like that. That's, that's, that's the kind of relationship I want to cultivate with people inside. And, you know, coming back to that original question about, you know, how I got started in this kind of, self-care thing is there was that question on the side of that lake of like, when did it become okay to neglect Kelly? When did it become okay to joke about that neglect? Um, and if I act on the stories about my own deficiency, you know, I start looking like a guy who it's okay to neglect. Um, but if I look at like a picture of myself when I was like four or five years old, I see a beautiful little boy who I would never leave alone. I would never, never, you know, and if he told me, but I'm different, I would gather in my arms and kiss him, take him running in the woods barefoot. So you're moving into retirement at the end of this academic year. How do you plan to spend your time in a way that's meaningful to you? What's next for Kelly Wilson? Well, it's been a pretty terrifying uh, period. Um, and I've suffered. My health has suffered um, in recent years. I've had some really difficult things um, in my work environment, like really profound stressors. Um, and um, uh, my dad... And my stepmother uh, died in my arms in the last year. Like, breathed their last breath in my arms. And um, I've closed my lab. And I'm down to, like, one last graduate student. And my child, my last of my uh, children moved out of the house about a month ago. And I turned in my letter saying that I would retire in May. So it's it's a, a kind of a whirlwind of, um, you know, reminding of the transience of all, you know, that all things pass away. Uh, it has often enough uh, felt as though uh, um, I were uh, uh, dying. <laughs> um, but there's this other piece of it, which is um, that... You know, I'm persistent as hell. Like, I really am a persistent uh, guy. And uh, so I have this kind of inkling of um, what's next. Um, and as much as I have loved being a college professor, it is time to let that go. Um, I'll continue to travel um, and uh, teach and uh, do some of that kind of consultancy. Um, and I'll continue to write. And one of the things I kind of have in mind is, um, I have in mind a different sort of writing. I want to write things that can, um, can help people, you know, to find, 
you know, to make peace with the differences and complexity within them. Um, that's sensitive to science, but at least as sensitive uh, to poetry. <laughs> now, what that looks like, I don't know. <laughs> and how to write it, I don't know. But I'm not dead yet, and I'm about to have a lot more time on my hands. So maybe I and you uh, will find out. <laughs> well, if you write it, we will look forward to reading it. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today and sharing a bit of your heart and a bit of your history and lots of your wisdom with us. It's been an honor and a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much, Diane. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. You can find us on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you are having a mental health emergency, please dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources on our webpage. Our website is www.offtheclockpsych.com. That's www.offtheclockpsych.com. Www